Hello everyone and welcome to TBR's Professional Services Vendor Benchmark Review. My name is Lindy Hansen and I'm the Director of the Professional Services Project here at TBR and I'll be your host for today's session. TBR's focus is to provide business research to accelerate our customers' success and the information we'll be covering today comes directly from our 2Q12 Professional Services Vendor Benchmark Report. The detailed report includes information on vendor strategy, geographic growth, business segments, and more. Information our professional services team delivers is invaluable to any firm with plans to expand our footprint or compete more effectively in global services markets. We're excited to present some of our findings to you and get your feedback on our information. Let's over to Brian and Ramunas. There are a few action items that I'd like to cover with you. First, we will be reading today's session and posting it to the TBR YouTube channel. We ask you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others we've posted. Next, we'd like to hear opinions and thoughts on the material we're presenting. Please send any questions or comments through the Q&A function or the chat function. Brian and Ramonis will address these at the end of the presentation. Next, we'll send out slides to everyone who's registered for today's webcast within 20 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. Now let's introduce analyst Brian Belanger and senior analyst Ramonis Farkas from the professional services team here at TBR. Brian primary author of the Professional Services Benchmark, and Ramunas has been covering the services market for over 15 years. With puts, the Professional Services team has got countless clients to improve margins and understand new global opportunities to expand their reach. Pat, let me hand this over to Ramunas and Brian. Before we get started, I wanted to basically answer the question, how does TBR get all this information? Where does it come from? The IT services vendor benchmark really is a compendium and a assessment of the various IT services vendors that we cover in an ongoing syndicated research. We, in terms of the whole number of vendors that are in our, or you know, that we cover by our professional services practice, we have 36. 31 are actually included in our IT services vendor benchmark. Uh, any other vendors that we cover, uh, we actually focus on and report on and additional benchmarks that we create for the company in terms of a, a healthcare information technology services benchmark, a public sector benchmark, as well as a management consulting benchmark. The things that we cover, we look at it from a professional services standpoint across all services line of business, across all the services lines of business, which is consulting, systems innovation, outsourcing, and in the outsourcing area, specifically IT outsourcing, applications outsourcing, as well as business process outsourcing. And we also make sure that, you know, for, for a number of vendors, there's a, a strategy and services support that, that occurs for some of these uh, vendors that we cover, and we include those in our analysis. Uh, pull these companies out, we look at their financial performance from a revenue standpoint, the profitability standpoint across the board. Uh, as a consequence, we get a good picture of what's going on within the respective companies. A few companies that actually focuses on vendors in specific companies as opposed to the overall marketplace. When you look at all the vendors that we cover uh, and you, you total up the, the numbers, we really uh, represent almost, in our benchmark, almost 50% of the total IT and professional services market. We really have a compelling case here of what's going on. We look at the industry leaders and subsequently know and have a good sense of what everybody else is doing as well. So the today's study, you know, a quarter ago we focused on applications outsourcing as a subsegment of our overall vendor benchmark, just to get a little more deeper insight into what's happening in the marketplace there. With changing as they always do in the IT services business, uh, we, we decided to focus on business process outsourcing this quarter. As a result, we're going to really be looking at some specific um, business processing and really cover some of the things that we see are happening in the marketplace. Uh, we're going to be looking at specifically what's driving, what's creating demand, and we see is basically a drive towards cost ache out by various clients. See how vendors are reacting, what they're doing in the marketplace. Uh, specifically focusing on a portfolio expansion and what vendors are really doing uh, in terms of to, to meet the demand that's there out in the marketplace. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the delivery 
regarding business process outsourcing, specifically how you know, various vendors are successfully delivering to the growing demands and needs in business process outsourcing. So I'm going to turn over the remainder of this discussion really primarily to Brian, uh, who will clean into the details here and giving you a much more clear picture of what's happening in IT services and specifically business process outsourcing. Brian? Thanks, Ramunas, and uh, thanks, everyone, and welcome, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so as Ramunas indicated, what I'll be doing is looking at each of these key trends from both an aggregate benchmark perspective and then diving down a little deeper to provide a next-level view based on our syndicated reporting and syndicated coverage um, at a vendor-specific level, building at cost takeout, portfolio expansion, delivery efficiency, both in terms of the aggregate for the benchmark and how individual leading firms, both in terms of revenue leaders and growth leaders, are addressing this marketplace. So to get into it with our first topic, it's this note of cost takeout. We believe cost takeout is really the driver that's moving IT services spending in the, in the current marketplace, particularly as macro, macroeconomic uncertainty persists in the U.S. and Europe. We shift in IT services spend away from more elective or exploratory discretionary projects, particularly in the consulting and system integration space, and sustained move towards more tactical, short-term, focused projects designed to take costs out of the business in the near term, efficiency, and generate um, shorter time to value and shorter time to realizing ROI on, on IT investments. Um, and that's reflected in overall benchmark revenue growth. If you look to slide, you see that total TTM IT services revenue. So that's total revenue, not for the global industry, but for, for the universe of 31 companies we cover growth accelerated to 4.4% in 2Q12 from 8.4% in growth in the year ago quarter and 7.6% sequentially. And as we'll see on the next slide, this is really occurring across all service lines with some differences. So as mentioned, this is really peeling back that layer and, and linking to what's happening in each of the core service lines, so, so the five we cover, so consulting and systems integration, business process outsourcing, applications outsourcing, P outsourcing, and then other, which primarily consists of hardware support and maintenance. So what we're doing here, again, just for our benchmark universe of companies, the 31, is 211 TTM revenue in an aggregate and 2Q12 TTM revenue uh, in each of those service lines, as well as year to year growth in each of these cases. And what we see is a deceleration across service line and growth between 2Q11 and 2Q12. What to point out, however, is that BP and AL have performed comparatively better, um, particularly outperforming overall projected GDP growth for 2012, which is pegged at about 2 to 3 percent. So, so while we do see this deceleration and we do see this need for cost takeout, we believe those two service lines, and BPO in particular, is effectively positioned to, to rest that need and to, to drive above average growth. I just want to interject here. This is removing this again. Uh, in last quarter's presentation when we, we were discussing applications outsourcing, one of the things that I had mentioned uh, was that in fact, in general, IT services outperforms the overall economic conditions in the, in the environment. Since companies are continuing to drive and try to improve and reduce costs and leveraging IT now and using it uh, as a mechanism to do so. So what we're seeing right now, again, is that, in fact, two of the service lines, and, in fact, all the service lines that really are performing to pretty much fill the overall economy. Uh, you know, GDP growth in, in Europe is, is in a very low single digits right now. Uh, we've seen, you know, a slowing in the United States. Uh, projections are anywhere from one to three percent. GDP growth may be a little bit higher, but not not entirely there. And, you know, in the APAC region, because of the slowness in U.S. and Europe, their exports are declining, and as a consequence, seeing many of the services firms uh, feed that 
and see that their IT services offerings and growth in revenue in those areas is also slowing down. What really pops out on the picture is that, in fact, applications outsourcing and now BPO really are is the top tier of growth for you know the overall professional services, and as a consequence, why we're really focusing on BPO today. And so, sort of hone in on that on that focus on BPO. What this graph is showing is TTM BPO revenue from our benchmark. So again, for the, the universe of the 31 companies, as well as um, year-to-year growth in, in metric relative to year growth in overall TTM IT services revenue. And what you see, if you can look at the um, graph here, is that BPO, BPO growth has traditionally and now continues to outpace overall services growth with the exception of a dip there in 4Q11. Um, and so the question becomes why? Why is BPO, why is BPO growth um, relatively outperforming performing the other service lines? And we think it's it's largely driven by the, the non-discriminatory nature of the service line. So it's it's one of the first things that we're moved to outsourcing vendors. Um, the high rate of renewal, we do we do not see a lot of project delays or cancellations. Um, it's an area that, that offers ease of adoption in term cost takeout and that near term ROI value proposition that we were discussing earlier. Um, for reasons we, we see that BPO is is more towards the needle of non-discretionary relative to the more elective services. Um, in, in, in addition, um, first, first time outsourcing in Europe and then an up in demand in emerging markets is why we see PO relatively outperforming overall industry growth. This is sort of a traditional benchmark view of the BPO industry. Um, it gives us a little bit more of a, a vendor-specific perspective in terms of um, who, who's growing, who's not, and who's sort of the established market leaders in terms of revenue. So, so just to set up this graph for you, the horizontal axis is BPO, TTM revenue growth. The vertical axis would be overall industry TTM growth. And then bubble size would represent TTM BPO revenue for that game. Even firm. So we can pretty quickly tell uh, firms are clustering around that negative percent to about 10 or 15 percent year to growth with some, some very clear growth leaders. Just to hide those, we see Atos and EXL sort of at the at the bleeding edge there, and that's largely driven by acquisitions activity. Atos with SIS and then more recently quality equipment and Excel who bought outsourced partners and then the Trumbull services. And then you know, one step down we see the, the India centric players who are, are really bridging that that uh, for arbitrage model to, to continue competing on cost and growing in the space. Now what I'd like to do is uh, sort of go back one more layer and then dive into a sort of for some of these revenue leaders and then some of the growth leaders, what are the strategies really driving that growth in BPO? Um, Zero, we'll, we'll dive into more, more on the following slide. But it's really, really two main initiatives. One is around bolstering that annuity revenue base that is really important to their business model on um, how to do that and how to infuse, infuse motivation through analytics into existing offerings to elevate value and create a, a cross-selling proposition then also to expand geo presence. If we look at Accenture, it's this notion of high performance BPO. So, so taking Accenture strengths in consulting, and pairing that with investments in technology, and in analytics, and then enabling all that through use of the GDN, the Global Delivery Network, having that low cost base, deliver a holistic BPO solution that's aligned to tangible business value and not just cost. So doing more doing more or less and, and aligning that to a business outcome. And lastly, there's Infosys, who we sort of is leading the arts in terms of nonlinearity, which is really really the push, um, especially in BPO, around the, the inventric provider base is decoupling revenue growth from, from health growth through investments in, in platforms, maybe vertical-specific platforms or horizontal that are 
unenabled and based on IP and technology rather than just the traditional lift and shift um, BP processes to a to a low cost location and, and more specifically to India. So just to look at Xerox specifically, as I mentioned, um, really two pieces I want to highlight here. One is expansion into emerging markets and in more than emerging markets, underpenetrated markets to establish new sources of BPO revenue and drop BPO revenue beyond that 10% and in, in, in peak into the double digits in terms of growth. And where that's happening is only in Europe and largely through, in Xerox's case, through acquisition. Um, we think a recent purchase of WDS and before that Excel World and in, in Consulting and, and even Dynamic, which have, have grown the firm's scale and delivery capabilities across Europe, bolstered its presence there, added new clients. Um, in the real way, the firm, which has traditionally been very U.S.-centric, is trying to diversify its base in BPO. is through through targeted acquisitions to grow revenue in Europe and in untapped markets. And then lastly, it's that notion of the, the annuity revenue base, which is really the the cornerstone of the Xerox model. So it's taking innovations and it's taking analytics and it's infusing that into existing offerings to increase the value of those offerings and create a compelling cross-sell or upsell proposition to uh, ensure that it continues to grow those those established BPO client relationships. This is yeah, one of the things that this space is in you know, it's, it's not a position to be in. It's one of the largest BPO providers. Uh, they really are somewhat in the same position as IBM in terms of overall IT services in that they're large. Uh, them to grow in any way, shape, or form uh, from their base uh, it takes quite a bit of effort and work. And that's why we believe they're really driving to expand geographic basis, uh, keep uh, expanding, you know, what they're they're in fact offering to the marketplace because growth for a large firm always is a little bit harder than a, than a small firm. Uh, in terms of a change in revenue, they, they probably are, are gaining just as much as any of the other vendors, but it doesn't show up from a growth perspective. But certainly, they are the large volume player in the BPO space at the present time based on our benchmark. That, let's sort of segue to our our second key topic here. So we're talking in terms of Xerox specifically. Well, how are they? How are expanding the portfolio and expanding reach to grow their BPO business? And so now I want to shift that focus to to looking at best practices in terms of some other vendors. And in most cases, we're seeing that's largely driven by targeted acquisitions. Um, particularly as we see this move in BPO from the lift and shift low cost model to a model that's more driven by by offering more innovative value add services and, and addressing addressing tangible business outcomes and aligning delivery and setting up KIs and even pricing structures such as outcome based pricing, aligning that all to a business outcome. Um, we have acquisitions as the primary conduit for, for vendors expanding the portfolio to sort of get to that level and establish meaningful revenue from from offerings in that regard. And so we really see acquisitions occurring in four areas. May it be the Xerox model to expand globally, um, to push vertical specific BO capabilities, and and beyond that to integrate analytics and other high value emerging technologies into core offerings. And lastly to to the stable of tools and IP assets to ensure that that growth is profitable growth. One of the things that we also don't re for the sake of this presentation, didn't get into very heavily, but the fact that for BPO clients to expect price reductions and 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 smaller and smaller costs associated with the outsourcing of their various business processes, they expect you know that the that that's providing the service knows more about the client, can provide them at a lower cost. Uh, they've got more experience and so forth. So there's a considerable pricing pressure, and obviously it impacts the revenue stream for you know for, for BPO vendors. 
And as a consequence, the, the BPO vendors are really focusing on improving that issue. And the positions drive to that by, you know, creating uh, additional value to providing the BPO service, uh, be attaching, you know, analytics to the service, uh, putting additional, you know, mobility services or things of that nature, really expanding and improving the value proposition to the client so that the client sticks with the BPO provider and doesn't go shopping the, for the, just the lowest cost provider for the same type of service. Okay, so to sort of drill down to some specific company uh, tactics in this regard in terms of building the BPO portfolio through acquisition, I'll lump Atos and CI together here um, in that they're both using large-scale acquisitions of diversified IT and professional services providers to grow their, their scale, not only in BPO, but in other service lines. Um, to CGI, um, the more recent example of acquiring Logica. Logica, per our estimates, had about $276 million in TDM BPO revenue per our 2Q12 benchmark, representing over a third of CGI's current the new base in BPO. So that's that's bolted on a significant stream of BPO revenue and and a stream where CGI had traditionally had a limited presence in Europe. So that, that that's one avenue and then Genpack, which we'll highlight in more detail on the next slide, sort of a divergent approach. And that gets the notion of value more and and particularly linearity in terms of using graded acquisitions to build the portfolio of um, business business process platforms enabled over 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 the cloud. And to highlight Genpack in terms of, of how it's used acquisitions to to its BPO portfolio and, and really its whole portfolio. So, uh, very active in the acquisition acquisition space, making seven since the start of 2011, both on the T service. Services. Uh, we think of the largest being headstrong, particularly in that space, and then also in BPO. And there's two I want to highlight that sort of indicate divergent strategies in that regard. Um, the first is the purchase of Accounting Plaza, uh, which is in more of that Xerox model. So, so using using acquisition as a conduit for building scale in a place where they aren't. So, Account Plaza was essentially a captive. Of company Apple in the Netherlands, and Genpack used that purchase to to grab about 600 employees across the Netherlands, Poland, and Czech Republic with capabilities capabilities in finance and accounting, outsourcing, HR outsourcing, um, and so really that Xerox model that I discussed earlier of of building the geographic presence through m and and then also um, more more to the the point about nonlinearity and, and platform-based offerings is the purchase of high-performance partners. What that many offers is a cloud-based software for loan origination, which Genpack was able to integrate into its business process as a service offering to bolster the the end-to-end -end capability of that and, and deliver over the cloud a comprehensive business process platform that can be accessed a per-use basis and really um, targeting, reducing the reliance on headcount to deliver that sort of service. So that, that's an area we see Genpack continuing to make a push with acquisitions specifically oriented towards vertical industries such as uh, financial services, retail, and manufacturing. And so the, the platform sort of sort of brings us to our last point, which is deficiency. And the question becomes if, if this move is occurring towards towards BPO services of high value, owners are making these these moves to do so through portfolio investments, then how are they positioning their delivery model to do that? And there's there's really three pieces we see there and it and it's optimizing the actual delivery model, balancing nearshore, offshore and onshore resources. Sources. It's in investing in these platform solutions that we talked about with Impact, with Infosys, investing in tools and IP assets to automate processes that can be automated, reliance on headcount to support BPO growth, and ensure that they're driving 
growth that is profitable, not just growth for growth's sake in the space. And just to reiterate here, um, this becomes particularly important as we see, as we mentioned before, top line growth rates are accelerating. And so having this delivery model and, and these tools and platforms in place to probably deliver BPO services becomes even that much more important. So to just provide sort of an overview of what we see happening in terms of hiring, um, not, not necessarily specific to BPO here, but specific to the firms in our benchmark. So what's this showing, the, what's this showing is the offshore headcount in aggregate um, from 2Q10 to Q12, as well as the airshore offshore combined headcount for the, the benchmark firms we cover, as well as growth for each of those metrics. Um, Green being nearshore offshore headcount growth on a year, -year and then the black bar there being onshore growth. And what we see is um, pretty dark divergence in terms of offshore nearshore growth continuing to largely outpace on growth. Um, what, what I would like to highlight here, um, look at about 2Q11 moving forward to 2Q12, we do see this sort of what I'll call a funnel effect happening. What we're Year growth for each of these metrics or each of these um, groupings of headcount, if you will, are sort of coming closer together, um, and, and the, the split in growth is becoming less. And what we really attribute this to is is that move in BPO from a pure lift and shift or your mess for less arbitrage model to a more integrated model that that incorporates those consulting insights, and incorporates higher value services offered. Um, I'll just I'll cite two examples of, of Indian firms, um, Infosys, who just had a deal with Harley Davidson, and the requirement of them actually winning that deal was their agreement to build a a local delivery center in Wisconsin as part of that deal. Um, so it's becoming more of a client requirement to have that close touch collabor collaborative um, model in place, and then cognizant with to deal with ING, a very similar situation, um, requirement to establish, establish centers of excellence uh, in the U.S. and North Dakota and Iowa. So just two examples of what we're seeing as an overall trend here in terms of headcount. One of the interesting things from that chart also is that in, when you look at the overall headcount growth, especially the offshore headcount growth, it continues to outpace, especially in the, the BPO area, the revenue growth. So we're, the, the vendors still believe that there's a lot of room for BPO expansion, and they're trying to play to be ahead of the game in terms of adding resources so that they can cover their clients' needs as they come to pass, and expecting additional additional clients to, to really shift towards a more you know to start outsourcing their their not core business uh, processes so that they can you know then leverage their own internal on focusing on running their business and doing specific things that will create additional revenues for themselves. The other thing that, that we see happening based off of this chart is that uh, with with offshore resources also kind of escalating and going up, again, it gets back to the value proposition that we've been kind of discussing here uh, in terms of, you know, it's not just, you know, providing you the, the lowest possible uh, but also creating some additional value. Uh, in this case, you know, so when you create onshore resources and you have close face-to-face -face interaction, you improve satisfaction for the client, uh, you recognize maybe specific issues and problems that may arise much more quickly. All that is viewed and valued by the client and subsequently makes it easier for them to answer the specific needs that you, you, you know, that a client creates um, presents. Likewise, it's, it, it helps in terms of the renewal process for business process outsourcing. The uh, better and more satisfied you are with a given client, the more likely you are to renew that you know, outsourcing deal uh, and continue forward without having to go out and shop and spend resources and time to do so. So, Terrence, a sort of a vendor specific perspective here, I'll lump Cognizant and TCS into the same grouping and then. 
in that both heavily India centric and, and both highly leveraged on that India based model to support the Varine BPO. We'll note, however, that, that as we see the move in the industry towards more value add, both of these firms, like many of their India centric counterparts, are are making measured investments in in that direction. So I mentioned the deal with ING for Cognizant. They're also investing. Uh, so looking to, to Asia Pacific hubs outside of India, particularly as, as the cost advantage there dries up, looking to new markets both offshore and near shore to support cost efficient BPO delivery. So Philippines is the example there, um, a real announcement to to establish a delivery hub there. Um, ECS I'll note just in their their non India staff jumped from about 6.9 percent of their total staff in fiscal year 11 to 7.3 percent. So just an overall um, measured trend towards more local resources. And IBM, um, it's sort of an entrenching in this global delivery model, which we'll discuss on the following slide. So really three key points I want to I want to highlight with IBM. The first um, I just sort of summarized. So it's it's sort of I, I was just hinting at with cognizant. So so bring uh, regions where you haven't been before. So Latin America, Middle East, Africa, find finding those labor pools that allow for cost efficient BPO delivery as well as a more a more higher level of client engagement. So more cultural affinity, language affinity, time zone affinity. Um and Kessman in that regard has just announced three hundred million dollar investment. And, um, look at grow there's in Costa Rica up to a thousand people so so retensifying the focus on Latin Latin America from a delivery standpoint and BPL um, beyond that continued investments in tools through IBM research to automate processes where possible uh, reduce that reliance on, on on labor not only in India but in other nearshore and offshore markets to support delivery and lastly sort of harkening back to the this notion of uh, value added services, it's it um bumping these services, you inherently inherently can grow margins by by integrating analytics and integrating consulting and vertical specific insights into core platforms while still enabling delivery over the global delivery model. Um, you're able to to drive increased revenue from that without the need to to increase labor costs to support that delivery. As I mentioned, I mean, I'm sure he's aware IBM reported their, their earnings yesterday, and we did see a continuing decline for the third quarter in, uh, in terms of their services growth. Uh, we expect that our services numbers across the overall industry probably will be looking somewhat similar in terms of missing that and not necessarily declining as much as IBM did, but it's going to be a little bit more contraction. What an interesting things is that IBM's profitability continues to improve. Uh, and we believe what they're doing here in terms of what we've discussed, uh, especially from a manpower standpoint in adjusting their infrastructure and where and from where and from what regions they're delivering services, contributing to that positive profitability growth. And it's a trend that's going to have to be mimicked by many other firms to succeed in the business process outsourcing market, as well as the overall the overall IT services market. To sort of summarize and encapsulate under the umbrella of our our three themes here, the question becomes: Well, if are the trends driving driving investment and driving strategy and driving growth in BPO in these areas? The question becomes: What investments? Do vendors need to make to position for the future, and, and we sort of highlighted that throughout the discussion. But um, just to glaze over it again, and so we, we see shift in their term spend remains driven by cost takeout and improving efficiency in the business. Um, it's a, it, it continues to move towards that notion of for less. So so not just merely del delivering cost reduction, but, but but using the tools in the arsenal. And, and investing in higher value offerings and integrating vertical specific insights to deliver business value beyond just that cost reduction 
as well as measure that with KPIs and link it to shared risk or outcome-based pricing structures. Um, so vendors get there. In most cases, we're seeing it's, it's driven by acquisitions, so, so acquiring where they're not, both in terms of the portfolio and in terms of geographies where, where they don't necessarily have the scale. Um, we, we talked about GenPAC with its purchases focused in the platform space. We expect to see more in that regard through the latter half of the year. And then, then lastly, how do they position the, the delivery model to take advantage of all, all this? And we talked about developing that integrated model that, that is not only based on offshore India-based resources, but, but it's either utilizing acquisitions where needed or or thing organically. To, to bolster delivery centers in near shore and off onshore markets. And, it, and it's um, the investments that Infosys and Cognizant talked about. So collaborating with clients to develop little delivery centers to, to focus on process reengineering beyond just taking costs out of the process. And, and it's, so it's optimizing the delivery model to do that and address that demand. conclude our, our discussion on the, on the BPO outsourcing market and what we see is occurring from our IT services vendor benchmark. Uh, I'm going to everybody a moment to, to, you know, for questions. Uh, in fact, if you have any, please send them in. I know we've gotten a couple in already. Uh, and just give you a quick overview of what we see, what we're going to be focusing on for the third quarter in our uh, IT services vendor benchmark. I want to be very Closely looking at the healthcare market and seeing what's happening there from from a strategy. Certainly, it is a hot market uh, area across the board. A lot of discussion, a lot of activity going on there. We're going to be looking at SAP partnerships. Uh, certainly, alliances uh, in regards to SAP. We see it's a key growth driver, especially in the applications outsourcing area as well as many firms providing consulting and systems integration work around SAP. We're also focusing in on storage and big data. Uh, certainly, uh, it's where analytics comes into play highly. Uh, it's driving a lot of the growth. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, BM just reported their earnings and the indicated analytics was one of the key areas that they did see services revenue growth. So it's just an area of focus for us coming into the third quarter year. And then we'll be also taking a peek at emerging markets, uh, specifically focusing in uh, on the China market. Uh, and what is, you know, what's happening there? Is, are we getting, you know, traction there? Um, who's investing in China and why? Uh, what are we trying to do? So uh, thank you, Sean. We're going to turn it over to, to Lindy to, to Give us those questions that have come in. Thanks, Ruth and Brian. We had a couple questions in, and I'd like to encourage anybody that has questions on what we just presented to send them along. Uh, this question is a vendor specific question around Xerox services. They've been very active in um, making BPO acquisitions, so uh, what is your perspective on how that's going to continue going forward? I think if we, if we look at sort of how they, if Fired in recent times, and how I mentioned before, been very focused on sort of that that geographic piece of the puzzle. So, so they haven't had that presence in Europe in terms of BPO capability. So they they've really focused there through WDF, through Cell World, Innova Consulting, through building that scale um, and adding resources there in Europe. So I think we're we'll probably see a shift towards that second piece of the puzzle that we we're talking about. Um, in terms of integrating analytics and other technologies into the into the BPO portfolio, so so if I think about retail as an example um, in their customer care unit, so so find those specialized analytics providers that can that can monitor customer care um, interactions, pull analytics insights out of that, and and deliver them to the client um, for, for additional value beyond just managing the, the customer care interaction, but, but, but some ways to improve it and, and drive maximum efficiency out of it. So I think um, we'll see much more targeted, uh, vertical-specific acquisitions aimed to, to build um, that innovative piece of the BPO puzzle um, and sort of round out their offering. 
Great. The next question is around vertical markets and what vertical segments you think will like the most growth in uh, BPO over the next several quarters. Uh, so, so I did just mention retail in the context of Xerox, but I think overall, if we see um, a trend towards uh, a, more, a higher focus on customer engagement in improving the relationship with the customer, and, and in many cases, um, that takes the form of, of what BPO vendor do to help me improve the relationship with the customer, in, in particularly in customer facing industries. So we think retail, um, and we think when telecommunications. So customer service interactions in that space. So, so doing what I just did, as Xerox mentioned, only from an industry perspective. So, so in those those analytics technologies to improve the customer relationship um, through customer care, I build innovative BPO services in that space. And then I'd also call out healthcare um, due to the the continued move to sort of costs and um, and get processes and just uh, improve the efficiency in healthcare delivery. I think we'll see uh, continued BPO um, momentum in in that area as well. I think the healthcare is an interesting market because there are a number of much smaller BPO firms that you know at regional or even citywide level do get some support uh, from a business process standpoint. Uh, certainly, those firms, if nothing else, are prime acquisition candidates for the larger uh, BO, you know, players in the marketplace, and then take their skills and capabilities and leverage them across a broader customer base, uh, spread out, not maybe, you know, not within just a given country, but take it to a global level potentially. So, that is a, a large opportunity from a business process outsourcing standpoint. Oh, great. Uh, the next question is around um, investments in uh, offshore and nearshore resources and what you expect in terms of that trend going forward given um, some of the more collaborative um, and innovative client relationships that you've talked about. So I think what we'll see, um, particularly looking at it from the lens of the India-centric vendors, I think we'll see a, a much more focused push around around building that on-site presence. So I use Infosys as an example. Uh, they're targeting to have an even split of revenue from, from consulting services, platform-based solutions, and then traditional IT services. So it's really a required push around building out that onshore base. So I, I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, if I look to Infosys acquisition, it was more focused on consulting, but the purchase of Lodestone, which which added a uh, thousand on-site resources in Europe, I think we'll see more of that sort of activity, um, particularly from India-centric vendors as they look to move away from from this India model as as the costs just kind of dry up there, um, and and build this on-site footprint and, and really get. Get that moving in terms of the ability to deliver BPO services that that add value beyond cost. So I think we're going to see um, a much more concentrated investment by the India-centric vendors to to add those on-site resources. Great. So that wraps up the the Q and A portion here. Uh, I'd like to thank Brian and Ramunis, and thanks to everyone for your questions and for joining us today. Before we go, I'd like to mention our upcoming webinars on healthcare IT services, public sector IT services, cloud professional services, and the global delivery market landscape. So www.tbrevents.webex.com to register for any of these events. We'll leave the function open for another five minutes to give folks a chance to ask any last-minute questions, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again next quarter. Have a great afternoon.